so let me give formal introductions first so good evening everyone so let me introduce myself first myself akash malareddy i am the regional ambassador of telangana for algo bharat and today we have uh, a couple of speakers from uh, all grand foundation and algo bharat so let me introduce sunil sunil is uh, algo bharat the regional ambassador for ahmedabad and we have mudasir our uh, engineer from algo grand foundation also we have jessu he is uh, from assam regional ambassador algo bharat so sunil and uh, mudasir the stage is all yours okay thank you akash for a lovely introduction now give me a moment guys so i can just share my screen let's see let me know once you are able to see my screen yes so the first question foremost question is guys when we start or when i start blockchain i always want to know a pe people's perspective that what are you thinking about blockchain so whatever you think about blockchain you can write in the chat you can uh, bitcoin of course okay ruthvis ruthvis uh, says bitcoin anyone else uh, rupantar says decentralization uh gayatri says end to end encryption keshav says smart contracts so guys i need definition i don't need that whether you are six feet tall or you are black you are white you are brown you have 32 teeth you have 30 teeth i am asking what is blockchain you are all you are mentioning is characteristics right so use for secure transaction nidhi says uh, peer to peer connection fact influence i'm not sure what's the name but database he says database Keshav says digital ledger, chain of blocks, uh, cryptographic hashing between blocks. So again, guys, uh, all these things are basically what you can say. Uh, the most common answer, if I can tell, is this one: ledger. Right? Everybody agreed on this point that it's a ledger. Okay. Now let me just brief you about. And somebody said uh, peer to peer. Then somebody said. Uh, secure connection somebody said end to end encryption something like whatsapp according to their advertisement end to end encryption somebody said uh, uh, bitcoins right so let me just tell you exactly how these all things started so little bit of history let's take a look at that so in 2008 we have an economic meltdown a very huge economic meltdown in us specifically which led to other countries and there was a severe problem in economics right i mean probably it may happen that some of you have not even born at the time but still that's the that is a huge economic meltdown we have seen or i have seen in my entire life after spending 15 years in the industry after spending through three years in the government as a custom inspector i have seen the worst economic meltdown at that time right now because of this economic meltdown satoshi nakamoto it's a nickname so nobody knows male female group single person hacker white hat gray hat nobody knows who this person is wrote a paper around parallel economy you can say or you can say digital currency or you can say whatever you want to say in terms of idea so digital currency so what he guys somebody's mic is on so can you please mute yourself so overall this digital currency the idea of this white paper was around how to solve the problems of current economics or current economy which was mostly led by banks and due to fractal banking this all problem started so based on this one in 2008 only somebody came up with an idea of or somebody released a platform called bitcoins right which is basically what a digital cryptocurrency 
Now the challenge over here was nobody knew what was bitcoins. Now currently, if you are investing in share market or any IPO, you know what is the company doing, where is it located, who are the owners, what is it, what are what are they trying to achieve? But bitcoin is, I mean, they don't have any solid basis. Nobody knows who owns the company because it's decentralized, as we say. We'll try to understand that word also. But overall, what is this? It's just a digital cryptocurrency which was released in 2008. And the first transaction ever happened in, uh, I guess, Bitcoin was somewhere around 12 Bitcoins was were transferred to buy a, a, a packet of bread or something. Uh, you can Google and maybe it is something like that. So the point is, it was difficult for people to understand that something like this can also exist and can have value. Right. Then, after five years, People realized the power of blockchain. Meanwhile, this blockchain or this Bitcoin basically got reputation. And very high amount of reputation people started to understand because if they knew that it is backed by mathematics, it is backed by cryptography. So it is all there. But then after five years, people realized that we can leverage this technology apart from just releasing the cryptocurrency. And that's where the first programmable blockchain, or you can say the first programmable blockchain came into existence, right? Led by Vitalik Buterin. And this actually fueled the entire idea of blockchain. Even, even in this paper, the platform or the technology is not called blockchain, but because the way it behaves, where the, why, I mean, the, the blocks are connected with each other. That's why this is called now blockchain, right? So after 2013, people started to understand what is blockchain or what other areas of or other avenues of blockchain can be explored, right? And then in 2008, uh, 18, sorry, Algorand came into existence, right? We will discuss about that. But basically, this is the entire journey in terms of blockchain. But point is still there. What is the requirement of blockchain? Just because it produces cryptocurrency? Uh, no. Then what is the point is? What is the point of having uh, blockchain? That's where newer platforms or web technology, you can say, came into existence. Over there, we can have web 1.0. Then currently we are in the era of web 2.0 and web 3.0 both. Right. So what people called or started to call blockchain as a web 3.0 and a journey. And web 3.0 basically everybody comes across with certain terms, which terms basically they come up, up with centralization or decentralization, uh, uh, opposite to centralization. Then we have distributed programming. Then we have DLD, that is your distributed ledger technology. Then we have wallets, we have blockchain, right? All these terms, we have smart contracts, all these terms came into existence. But point is over here, what was the, or what was the need of web 1.0? Why we had web 2.0 and why do we need web 3.0? So, anybody who wants to jump in, what was Web 1.0? Anyone? We are getting some response in the chat box, Sunil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a second. Hold on. Let me just save the file so I can share later on. Yeah. So the first generation of World Wide Web also referred to as the read-only web, then version, text-only, read-only websites, HTML. Yes. So all of you are right. That web 1.0 basically was read-only. That means you are just able to read the data produced by someone. But can you guys tell me if somebody is not creating a page, how will you read? So it was read and write both or just read? Because you can read whatever somebody is writing. But if somebody is not writing, how will you read? So what was it? 
Read only or write also. Anyone? Yeah, static pages, I got that. My point is somebody said it's read only. Yes, so Rupantar has the right answer. Only developers or for those who had the privilege, right? So basically read only, yes. But write only, read only by all or read only for all. But write only for a very few, right? Then we had, or right now we have rather web 2.0. So what is web 2.0 now then? Anyone? Interactive, right? So web 2.0, the first term everybody uses is interactive. So currently what we are doing is a part of web 2.0, right? We are <coughs> exchanging voice and text information over the internet. So interactive. Uh, Full-fledged application, anyone can write. So basically I can say content generation, guys, right? that this is an era of content generation. So anybody can generate, basically. So everybody is on the same page, like on Instagram. But do you think that on Instagram or Twitter, everybody is on the same page? On Twitter, if you don't have a blue tick, so if you are not a celebrity, and if you are a regular user like uh, me or you, so do, do we have the same level of, uh, you can say, uh, roles or accessibility to the Twitter? No, right? So the point is, there is still some gap in Web 2.0 also. But do we bother about that? No, because we know that we are not a celebrity. So we are happy about what, with whatever we are getting. But there is one separate challenge with Web 2.0. So anybody can or uh, let me know what is the challenge with Web 2.0. Protection, no, it is not about just protection. Uh, okay, Gopal says it is centralized. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. So what exactly, which, what is added by Web 3.0? Let's see. Immutability and security, but that is also can be possible with plenty of other options. You don't need blockchain to do that. Some organization has all the power. So basically, you're talking about decentralization. Yes, maybe. Right? So, somebody says decentralization. Then somebody says security. But you are still not giving me the word. Platform anonymity. Yes, data was not secured. No needy. And data was pretty damn secured in uh, 2.0 also. I mean, have you ever heard that banks got hacked and all? No. Misinformation, manipulation, polarization of users by malicious actors or biased algorithms. One can change the data, consolidating content. These are all characteristics of Web 3.0. Agreed. But the most important piece you guys are missing is ownership. So now you are the owner of your data. That's where your exact picture comes in, in, the, uh, in the domain that now you are the owner of the data. In Web 2.0, you are not owner. I can prove that. In Web 2.0, our current situation, whenever you tweet or whenever you generate any sort of data over either that's a LinkedIn, Instagram, or any other platform, if you are not having enough followers, you will not get a dime, right? But do you really think that what is the content generation done by all those celebrities versus all those people like us? So our content is high in terms of generation, but it is not famous because it is not backed or because we are not a celebrity and all. So point is content generation mostly is done by people like us and earned by someone else. So over here, now we are having the ownership. That means whatever we generate, we own and we can earn. Whatever we are going to earn, 1 rupee, 2 rupee or 2 million. Right? So that's where people intrigued about this entire idea of Web 3.0. But the challenge lied over here, decentralization. So any idea, I mean, we are living in the era of centralization since last, let's say, 5,000 years. So suddenly after 5,000 years, why do we need decentralization? 
Like do it, do do. You, I mean, okay. Let's say somebody says interoperability, signature less, open to everyone. But do you really think that this can have? I mean, when you say that you are you are you want to live in a decentralized world. Let's say you are living in uh, any place, and there is a there is a crossroad near to your house, and that crossroad has a traffic signal, and the traffic signal you want it uh, to set up for thirty seconds, while Mudassir wants it for forty seconds, while I want it for. 60 seconds akash may be wanted for uh, 1.2 uh, minutes hypothetically how will we decide akash wanted that 200 meter away from the current location budasir wanted as it is i wanted removed jesu can come up with some different idea so in 140 crores in india how will we decide based on decentralization and every time you take a vote then when will you execute So, do we really need decentralization? The answer is no. Why? Because uh, Rupantar has an interesting answer. Paper money don't actually have any value, my dear friend. Rupantar paper money has value, right? Because it is backed by gold, so it has value, and it is issued. That's why it is issued by the government of any country and not by everyone else, right? So, the point is over here. decentralization we need but at a level only not completely decentralized world otherwise it will create just a simple plain chaos so we need a mixture of both so at which places do we need decentralization then let's say let's talk about that now because we there is a term over here decentralization which i have written so decentralization exactly where do we need decentralization so when most of the time we need when we talk about data manipulation somebody wrote polarization and data manipulation and all so data manipulation we want to avoid but the point is why why do we need to avoid data manipulation any guesses election <laughs> yeah nice answer election we are going to have pretty soon in our country so yes probably but i mean now other areas are also taken care of but elections cannot be manipulated now to preserve integrity of data so ruthvi the question to you is do you really think that before blockchain every every single data was corrupted on the planet earth and there was no medium of preserving the integrity of data well, whoever wants to speak guys you can write in the chat huh? don't because it is being recorded so it is not wise to have mics open otherwise it will have some uh, voice issues and all so my question is uh, okay keshav says anyone can change the data, data data according to them and influence others in wrong way right now do not have interference of hackers okay avoid plagiarism okay now the point is decentralization or blockchain if you think that all these things are not possible in blockchain you have to think again now let me prove how so we talked about data manipulation so data manipulation in order to avoid this data manipulation we have what everybody said voting and election so in voting and election generally what do you do you voice your opinion right now when you voice your opinion what exactly you are doing but using anonymity that means you are not known to the world that what was your opinion you provided an opinion being a citizen of this country that's fine but what was your opinion that is nobody can check that what was your opinion fine how will you find out that who won the election so that's where your consensus mechanism lies right now what is a consensus mechanism basically so agreement right now in this consensus mechanism when we talk about let's say election so how do you define a party won the election in india 51% right guys 51% votes whoever gets the 51% vote votes they won or maybe majority not even 50% let's say there are four five parties so one party uh got let's say 30% the other party got uh, 40% and the remaining 20 so 20, 40 60 90 and 10% or something like this then which party won the one which had most uh votes 40% so basically over here 
it may not be 50%, 51%. It may be the highest number in the total of all the values. So over here, the total of all values is 100. So we can say that it is 40. The, the, the person or the, uh, the party who had 40% of votes won the election. Fine. Or won the opinion, whatever it was there. We can say that. So now over here, Okay, Anjali, go ahead, ask your question. I guess she might have misclicked. So what we what I was talking about is how to reach onto this agreement. Everybody said that okay, this is this cannot be manipulated and this and that. How? How this cannot be manipulated? Why? Because everybody said with one voice that blockchain is immutable. Okay. Why? Why blockchain is immutable? Because you are saying blockchain is immutable. That's why we have to believe. So I'll say that uh, any other technology previously known to the mankind is also immutable in comparison to blockchain. So how will we prove that blockchain is immutable? Anyone? Because max nodes have the same data. That, uh, that is a definition of uh, distributed programming. We are using cryptography. Yes, cryptography is being, is being used since 1942. Hashing. But again, how? Disrupt the link with previous and next address. Okay, so everybody is in the same direction. Now let me prove how. Okay, give me a moment. So imagine these are all transaction data or whatever you are saying, since you are all know what is hashing and what is transaction and all. So just to brief you guys, hashing is a one-way function, which is a deterministic function. That means once you convert something to hashing, you cannot go back. So it's, that is, it is one-way function. It is deterministic. That means two same inputs will generate the same output every single time. And it is final. That means no two different out inputs can have the same output, right? So if you go ahead and check over here, hash. So if if this is a, just a blank only, still you can see at the bottom the length is this much, right? But if I type down anything else, still the, the length is still the same. It doesn't increase. So we don't know exactly what was the input. And that is the basic of hashing. And this is a very important function, hashing, because it will be used while your programs also. Right? So this is used, but how? Let us see that how part now. So over here, consider this. This is a chain of blocks. That's why it is called blockchain. So there are one, two, three, four, five blocks. Now over here, <coughs> first block, which is basically called a genesis block. Right? Genesis block. See what happened. When I typed something, all of the blocks now converted to pink. Right? But if I remove that, everything is okay. It's in green. So the point is why it is in green. And what is, what is the use of hash in blockchain? So at the bottom, you can see that there is some value at, listed at the bottom. Hash value. Where the previous value is all the, let's say, some zeros. But here are some values there. And if you carefully look, the same value is in the previous value box over here or the second block. That means now they have formed a chain. Current hash, previous hash. Now, if you go to block number three, you will get the same hash which is at the bottom over here in the previous box. Right? So this is how all the blocks are connected till the last block. Now, if you disturb any data, so now try to understand, guys, blockchain is immutable only when the data is recorded into the blocks, not into transactions. When the data is recorded into the block, because once the data gets recorded on the block, then and then this hash is produced. 
using a merkel root tree mechanism right so over here whatever whatever data you have created or you have put into block that generated this hash so if i write down over here genesis see what happened every other block now converted to pink because now you have to write the block again so in the other word you have to mine the block again right so one word uh, in the glossary we have missed is mining so that now we need to mine this block again now see what happens okay now this is in green we have a new hash now i need to mine this again also so now these both hashes are same so if i now mine this one yeah that's also done this is just a random thing uh, guys this is not even real blockchain this is just random programming only so now in order to change data in the block you have to change across all the blocks after that block not previous to that block after that block why because if i change the data over here it will not affect all the previous blocks so try to understand this one guys blockchain is not a silver bullet right it has its own limitations you have to understand what those limitations are in order to be a better blockchain developer so if you change the last block you have to mine the last block only and not the previous blocks so there are various kinds of attacks also happen on the blocks and all okay i mean we are not <coughs> touching that part <coughs> but my point is this generated a different hash and that's why it needs to be mined again so if i remove that it will all be green so <coughs> this is how the entire blockchain data gets recorded into the blockchain and after getting recorded this is the behavior right and this is very important for everybody to understand where these exact technology is coming from right so first of all if you go to hash you will see that this is whenever data gets recorded so let's say i can have multiple transactions like uh, uh, sunil gave 1000 uh, rupees to mudassir right so this is a transaction right now the point is now may happen that mudassir uh, gave 500 rupees back hypothetically in a month or so and then again mudassir gave 500 rupees back so that's fine the transaction is transaction is over now but the point is there are three pieces of information in the same block in the data piece and you can see the hash is still the same value even if i just remove the dot the hash will change so basically what we are trying to achieve over here is whatever we are doing it will impact the hash outcome and that's how the data once it is recorded once the hash is generated once the next block is connected using that hash your data becomes immutable if you go to block over here right you will see that block has the number this is which is this is basically known as height block height that's a numeric uh, board so i will i was not able to write but this is known as block height this is a random number so nonce is basically known as a random number or you can say hypothetically number only once something like this somebody came up with the name nonce so this is nonce is basically a random number right you will need to study the merkel root tree in order to understand this entire cryptographic details merkel root tree right and currently we are we have also progressed in that part so now we don't have merkel root tree exactly now we have felicia, uh, felicia merkel root tree which is an extension of merkel root tree but again this is a very basic lecture so i'm not going to cover any of those but in your free time you can understand you can read about this one so you can see that the data now because of this data the hash got changed so you have to mine again so block num block has different different properties 1 2 3 and this one is the one which is most unique because this is the value which will allow this block to be connected with the other block to form an immutable chain right so it is not like it is possible to change the data of blocks 
but it is not possible to change the immutability. That means you cannot change this one, but you can change. It will the changes will be discarded. So it is not like that. You cannot change, but you can change, but it will not be acceptable by the blockchain or by the network. Clear? Any particular method to create hash? Hashing is uh, the algorithm itself. So it's not a method. It's a hashing is an uh, encryption algorithm. So uh, you can... there are a lot of uh, encryption methods. Uh, SHA three, SHA two fifty six. Like uh, previously, uh, they are using MDF, MDN five, I guess, right? Yeah. So, no, sir, MD five, MD five. MD5. So, uh, but it was uh, corrupted, I guess. So that's uh, after that. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we are using SHA-256 uh, mostly. Yeah, yeah. let me just yeah. try to turn over here. So encryption methodologies are various encryption algorithms are there, right? Like hashing is an algorithm. Same way MD5 is an algorithm. Same way uh, ASA is one more. Currently, most of the people are using ASA. It is advanced something algorithm. Then we have SHA, which is known as simple hash algorithm, which is basically 256 bit. So the, the complexity lies over here. It can be 8-bit, it can be 16-bit, it can be 32, it can be 64, it can be 128, or it can be 256-bit, right? So based on your requirement, you have to use this one, any of the algorithms. There are plenty, plenty. But why blockchain or the people who have conceived blockchain, why they went with hashing, there is a story for that because hashing is a puzzle-friendly algorithm. Now, most of the people, you will not find this answer that why hashing is used and what does it mean by puzzle friendly, right? So over here, I'll talk about something first and then we will get that answer. We talked about this one, right? How we, uh, I mean, we store the data over there in the demo. Also, we saw that everybody has to agree. So there has to be a consensus mechanism to identify the anomalies in the data, right? So that's how the first blockchain platform in the world, which is known as, known, which is known as Bitcoins, had a typical consensus mechanism known as POW, right? So over here, if we talk about POW, which is known as proof of work, right? Now, what is proof of work over here? So guys, if you, let's say if you are, if you are studying, so how do you prove that you study? You go to college, you give your exam, your professors will rate you based on your performance. You get a certificate at the end of the semester and the final mark sheet of the, your graduation is over. So without that piece of paper, can you prove that you are a student or you were a student? No. So everybody in this world needs to prove, whoever needs to prove that they have done something, have to also establish that they have or showcase something that they have done. So in order to make blockchain decentralized and completely run by cryptography, the consensus mechanism itself is not done by anyone else. Otherwise, again, the same corruption, polarization, manipulation comes in the picture. Now, how do a system is completely automated? We'll identify that, okay, somebody has done and somebody has not done. So in order to completely uh, align up towards this proof of work, we need to understand how blockchain works, right? Now, guys, it may happen that some of the discussion can extend towards tomorrow because this is very important for everybody to understand why this entire piece of technology came into existence, right? So if we talk about blockchain in that way, that why this proof of work is required, right? Because it's, if it is, if we are saying that it is backed by cryptography, it is backed by mess, fine. What is this then? So, the most important term over here is trust. So, we know that when we say, okay, now before that, I'm not sure whether you guys have heard about this one or not, but let me give you an example over here that, uh, yeah, AES is one such algorithm. Sorry, not ASA, AES. AES is different one. AES, AES is advanced encryption. Something is S. I forgot the last part. So, can we extract any information from transaction hash? Aman, yes. Depends on what you are using. If the data which is recorded on the blockchain is encrypted, then no, you cannot. 
but if data is not encrypted then you can but again if you want to that which particular information made that transaction or generated the transaction has then answer is completely no since i said that hashing is a one way function so now let me let me just give you a puzzle now let's say there are two generals in the army general a and general b and they have to attack the enemy now the point is both the generals are departed from each other and they have to attack the enemy at the same time otherwise they will lose the battle now in order to attack at the same time there has to be some means of communication which doesn't exist because we are talking about pre technology era or maybe uh, even minus that bc era and all so point is then how both the generals will attack at the same time this is a computer problem so don't think that i am giving you a history lesson this is known as a byzantine generals problem in computers or in the it industry so anybody how how will general a send a message to general b no one messenger sending some kind of code some kind of code but how messengers and code both both answers are correct now the challenge is the code can be sent by messengers right okay again general a sent one messenger which was caught by the enemy and they both lost the war now uh, military use some hand sign no I mean, okay. I can tell you that also that when the uh, when the enemy caught the messenger, they changed the uh, the force. The uh, Morse code Mor <laughs> Morse code was not pre technology era. That was technology era. I'm talking about pre technology era. So no Morse code. Pigeons no. Pigeons can be shot. So no. By creating any kind of sound which is heard by the enemy also. So no. So the answer to this puzzle was. maybe some type of machines like enigma enigma was built in 1942 i'm talking about um pre technology era in the bcs or maybe 5000 6000 bc messengers and receivers yes the answer is messengers but the point is how do we send or how much how many do we send since i said that okay one if you send maybe it is caught by the enemy and you got lo you lost the battle so we can send at least 10 let's say hypothetically so if we send 10 messengers maybe 3 4 caught by 3 actually caught by uh, your uh, enemy but 6 passed so now general let's say general a sent all these messengers and general b received yes encryption is fine i mean at that time when we talk about encryption also is there so the point because and some sort of encryption was there since the beginning of humanity right so over there also six messengers say that okay general to general b that general a said that the attack has to happen at 4 pm while four messengers which were manipulated by the uh, by the enemy said that the attack has to happen at uh, happen at 6 pm now in this case uh this case what will we do what will general b do will he go with six people or will he go with four people majority right so we normally and of course almost every single time we go with majority so what will general b do he will go with six people and six people said attack at 4 pm so they both attack at attacked at 4 pm and they won the battle but what if enemy captured six people now six people are saying attack has to happen at 6 pm while four people are saying that attack has to happen at 4 pm now what so now we have a problem because now the minority is the answer not the majority so what happened over here we lost because the number was very less only 10 what if the number is 100 slightly difficult to capture 51 soldiers what if the number is 1000 quite impossible yeah somebody sufian says 1000 yes becomes difficult extremely difficult what if 
impossible. Of course, 10,000 spies is a very huge number, but still impossible. So this is the only technology which improvises the security when the number is high. Right? When, I mean, there is a statement or there is a definition of secret. My favorite definition is secret is only secret if it is known to you. If I, if I tell Mudassir my secret, half of the Delhi will know by noon, right? And rest half by tomorrow. So the point is, if I know the secret, then it is secret. If, if I tell one person, then secret is known to everyone, right? So the point over there is, what we wanted is we told over there, because we sent 10,000 people. So in order to corrupt the data, or corrupt the signal or corrupt the information, we had to capture or manipulate 5,001 people, which is quite impossible. That's where blockchain achieves the security. Why? Because we saw that over in the demo itself. Then in order to change this one, we had to change in five different places. And we were able to do because there were only five places. But imagine where there are one lakh miners across the globe managing your data generated by you by the blockchain users how will you manipulate 50001 computer nodes across the globe at the same time not possible and that's why blockchain data what what is recorded in the blocks and connected via the hash cannot be changed again or can can be changed but cannot be recorded again Right. So this is how the consensus mechanism plays a very important role. So over there, the proof of work basically is when we say that, okay, 10,000 messengers were given a piece of information. And that piece of information basically is a transaction. Transaction from general A to that particular person. But was that information for that person? No. That information was there for General B. But information was given to a soldier, to a spy. Right? But the information was critical for General B. But we wanted the, you can say, regular information or original information or uh, immutable information to reach to General B. That's why we told that information to 10,000 people. So even if some of the enemy spies are in General A's army. They are not also able to convert 5,001 people. So the information was critical to General A and General B, but stored by some third party. And that third party is called minor. Why? Because that third party has stored that information for you, which was your secret, your information. And that's where the entire blockchain exists now. Because this miner, let's say uh, the general A decided that whoever reaches on time on the, uh, the next general, maybe they get rewarded. Or because basically in the cases of generals, because they are, they are in army, they are paid salary. So that is their job. But over here, we don't hire miners to do our work. So miners are basically the secret holders or secret bearers. So whatever you transact on blockchain, it is the miner's job to make it immutable. Why? Because they will pick up your transaction and record into a block. But since they are the guys who are doing the work, they are paid some rewards. Now, when it is a matter of reward, let's say I need to, uh, because since I, I gave a task, let's say hypothetically to, uh, Akash and Akash was uh, let's say hypothetically uh, Akash owns a company and Akash gave me a task so what happens once I finish the task Akash has to pay me you go to a mall you buy a t-shirt you have to pay so that's a reward mechanism no it's a simple barter system but again because you you bought somebody's work you paid so over here somebody recorded your transaction so you have to pay and that is reward but we know that the, we hold the T-shirt in our hand. We saw the color. We liked it. We, we checked in the changing room and all. We liked the brand. So we bought. Over here, we don't even know who was the miner. 
right? Who actually recorded the transaction for us in the blockchain? So that miner has to present the work, right? This is basically identifying a random number, nothing a big secret, but identifying a random number which finishes the transaction and gener generates the same hash, which we just saw. So once the miner presents that, okay, see, this is these are the steps required for me to solve this puzzle. And this is how I solve the puzzle. And this is your answer. So if the cryptographic algorithm agrees to that, that miner is rewarded. But in the general A and general B's case, every soldier, because they were soldiers and they were paid salary, over here, only one miner gets the reward. So the challenge over first, <coughs> first challenge over here is multiple miners, right? And everybody, because it's a, it's an Olympic, it's an Olympic of restoring the records, where every single person on the planet of Earth can participate, if you are allowed, right? In the, because various platforms, they don't allow everyone. And some platforms, they allowed anyone. So if you are allowed, you can do that. But in order to find out that puzzle, you need to invest in hardware. You need to have a better machine. You need to consume electricity. So all this electricity, because of this race, electricity consumption skyrocketed. And that's how most of the countries have banned cryptocurrency mining in the world. Right? Because it has nothing to do with blockchain. It is just because of this POW mechanism. And then people realized that this will not work. If we move on to move ahead, this sort of electricity consumption will not work. This sort of behavior also can be manipulated because of 51% attack where, where still at the time also were happening. Even currently, they, were, they are happening. So after some time, we had one more mechanism, which is now known as POS, proof of stake, right? This proof of stake basically is one step ahead in comparison to POW. In POW, anybody can become a miner and start getting rewards. Over here, you have to buy in your stake. That means you have to put your own money to get rewards. Again, this is again a problem. Why? Akash is very rich. He is a billionaire. He can invest two, uh, 2 million while I can, me and Mudassir or Mudassir and I can invest only 10,000. So being because his stake is higher, Akash will get a higher chance to get the rewards or to get the next mining block. So these also, this POS or consensus mechanism also can be manipulated. And that's where Algorand comes to rescue. And now we have PPOS, which is basically pure proof of stake. This particular mechanism avoids this behavior that even if your stake is on higher side, because over here, higher, what is the definition? Higher the stake, higher the chances. So everybody in one, with one voice said that this cannot be manipulated, this can be manipulated. Right. So this particular platform, Algorand, it believes in a different mechanism, which is known as pure proof of stake. Now here, stake is there. That means it is an extension of POS. Yes. But there is some other parameter also included to make it pure proof of stake, which is now or which cannot be corrupted or which cannot be manipulated like POS. So now there is first piece of homework for you guys. Homework piece of information you can find out. You can Google. It will not take more than five minutes. How your proof of stake works or how it manages this behavior. Higher the stake, higher the chances of reward so that manipulation is possible. How PBOS awards this one. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Any questions from anyone, guys? So low trust left now. Uh, Mana, <laughs> what happened?
Any questions, guys? Anyone? Since it is eight o'clock, uh, now you can uh, mute yourself and yes, uh, you can uh, ask the questions. Yes, for sure. Or anything uh, you want to repeat, or you, yep. uh, anything you didn't get. I think uh, Sunil sir has already cleared everything. Like, bacha bhi samajh gaya hoga. <laughs> yeah, because it was uh, wait. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, Sunil sir. And uh, like, if you still have some doubts or problem, you are here. Rewards. Uh, rewards is basically once again explain miners versus hackers. <clears throat> uh stake is basically uh, let's say you are living uh, you are you we are going to uh, see a movie. Sorry, sir can i take this question yeah yeah go ahead go ahead so uh, meganand what is stake stake is basically you are locking some amount so that uh, let's say uh, i'm i am staking my amount why i am doing this because maybe after some time i can hack or maybe i want to be a corrupt maybe i i am the adversary node so in Ethereum, why you have to stake or any other blockchain, like a lot of blockchain you have to stake so that you you can like you should be honest. Like if you are staking, uh, staking some amount and uh, like if you get corrupt, your that stake amount will be logged and you cannot get. So uh, in staking, we basically stake our uh, Ethereum algorand and it costs some amount, right? So we are locking our actual amount, actual money. So that in future, if we want to corrupt or if uh, we can uh, like uh, maybe adversary node or anything else, so our that stake will be logged and you cannot uh, uh, claim it back. So that's why we have to stake so that everyone in the consensus node uh, would be honest. So that's the uh, stake mechanism basically. So basically what Mudha said told is you won't rob the bank in which you put your own money. Simple. So, that's that's very <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much uh, somebody said uh, hashing is one side so hashing is one side that is produced after a series of transactions and some couple of other pieces of information then the hash is produced and then hash is used to connect as a link as a link list to the other block that's how hashing is used while connecting to blocks I already showcased that over uh, here. Maybe uh, I will uh, please join tomorrow also. I will show you uh, all the properties of hashing. So this is basically due to avalanche effect. Uh, how does the change of data affect? Because yes. when you do any minor change in your input, the hash value will change. It is uh, like it is the algorithm. So this is its property, uh, which we call avalanche effect. So if you do a minor change, the hash value will change. So that's the property of uh, any hashing algorithm. Uh, somebody, I mean, I think tomorrow we need to uh, explain around this MD5, AVS and SHA. Yeah, sure. I will do that. So after, I mean, tomorrow, I guess uh, there are two hours, like 11 to 1, right? Yeah, we have a lot of time tomorrow. We can discuss. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we can discuss that. Okay. So guys, well, I will cover this uh, MD5 and all. Uh, in POW, Rajiv, it is possible in POS, as I told you earlier, that you don't wrap the bank in which you have your own account and your own money. So And uh, in POW also, it is uh, limited because uh, like uh, there is not a single miner, right? So if some miners uh, validate, uh, so not validate, a uh, minor transaction, other miners will also recheck that is it oh. correct or not. So every right. like in the node... When a miners um, mine a block, it will distribute in the network and others will check. So that's why they cannot be hacker. And uh, uh, this is basically, uh, Sunisa already mentioned that uh, uh, what is uh, like there is a 50, uh, three by two by three percent, I guess. Yes. Uh, uh, or 51%. The best yeah, yeah, number is 51%. No, no. In the PO, uh, there is two by three, per, uh, not percent, two by three. A network node have to confirm yes. them it will uh, get confirmed so that's the thing the bft thing benzatine fault tolerance, tolerance. tolerance. Yeah. so like uh, two part of three uh full uh have to be confirmed then only uh, it will mine so, so they basically cannot... when you say one person you cannot decide because that is you are only voting when you mm -hmm. are saying two percent the votes are equal so you need at least one more two minimize or to have the majority that's why it is two by three 
that's correct that's what i want to yeah i'm just simplifying for the sake right? yeah like i am learning it like i'm i'm making things complicated maybe uh, thank you so much sir <laughs> no worries no worries maybe next in the next class i will show that ppt and uh, you can sure. understand better yeah i'll just sit relax <laughs> and i can no no i'm not asking, i'm not saying you i'm saying the other students you are already yeah, you know everything <laughs> you are the god here <laughs> if wrong transaction is done we cannot reverse yes if the wrong transaction is done it is done you cannot reverse that you have to do it again or whatever the necessary steps that's why in smart contract when we when we start actual smart contract uh, it is very very mandatory to test very thoroughly otherwise you will end up into a serious trouble later on so there are ways to avoid this kind those kind of mistakes but yes if a wrong transaction is done it is done you have to compensate by doing one more but if you lost money <laughs> any sort of cryptocurrency there is no Coming call back. center where you call and <laughs> recall or uh, get the money back yes what will be there in tomorrow hands on session so uh, yeah sunil sir maybe you can hmm. so tomorrow we can start with algogit so since we have just briefly touched algorand so tomorrow just sir just a few features we will discuss about 5 10 minutes about algorand and then we will start algorand algokit how to start install uh, what is the what are the templates available how to run the first code sandbox environment in sandbox environment not on test network tomorrow will be just around sandbox environment <laughs> All right, so Akash Mudasir, I have to leave. Uh, yes, yeah, sure, sure. I'll be wait for next five to ten minutes. Yeah. If you have anything, uh, you can ask. Thank you so much.